thank you, Kevin, again. Um, yeah, so we are carrying on in Nehemiah there. Now, you'll notice that Kevin read from chapter 10, and uh, that was because I just wanted to remind us um, of the promise that they had made um, to God, because what we're looking at here, as we picked up on last week, what we're looking at is we're in the last chapter of Nehemiah, and if you remember last week, we, we learned that Nehemiah, after they built the wall, he came back, he helped them, led the people to build the wall, that then he stayed there as governor for 12 years, but then he returned to King Artaxerxes in Persia, and he returned there for, it didn't tell us for how long, for a certain amount of time, and then he came back to Jerusalem, and he found that they had drifted from all these promises that they had made that Kevin just read for us, and they had drifted from it. And so we need to have those in the back of our mind, because when we read today what Nehemiah discovers, we're going to see the same words. It's exactly what they promised not to do um, is, uh, is what they've now done and what they've walked away from. And so that's what we're uh, going to be this morning. So we are going to be in chapter 13, but I wanted to remind us of, uh, of the promise they had made so we could really understand where we were, where we're going. And so this morning, um, just to remind us kind of where we started last week, we said Nehemiah came back to, after 12 years he'd been governor, he's away, he comes back and he finds kind of four ways that they had slipped, right? And so we, we looked at this last week and we said, what are we going to do? We're going to look at it through this framework here. This, they had, there was kind of four sins that he discovered when Nehemiah got back. And so we kind of just use this. We said, what, what was the sin? How did they disobey God? How had they walked away? What had they done? And then the second question was, why did they do it? And we just talked about how, like, I mean, we wouldn't sin if we didn't want to, right? We only do it. There must be some desire. That's what a temptation is. It's a draw towards something. And so why did they do it? What was the temptation that was drawing them? And then what was the damage And this we can probably all speak to. We know that often sin is so nearsighted and we don't realize the the repercussions, the damage that it will have. And so often when we take time to reflect on that, it really helps us, right? Anybody who's ever, I mean, you think about addictions and things like that, it's like that's, they would have never, they go, only if I'd have thought about where this would lead, I would have never done it, right? But just those little things, that slow fade. Um, And so... We look at the damage, and then we look to apply it to us, because we're reading this. This is from 440 B.C., right? And so this ancient document. And so what lessons, what can we apply to us? What does it mean for us as we read this historical book? So last week, remember, we, we kind of, we were going to do two, we, we, but we did just the one there, Eliashib, the high priest. We found out ne- Nehemiah comes back, and Eliashib, the high priest, who's supposed to be in charge of these storerooms, kind of heard Kevin mention them in his reading, these storerooms that collected the tithes. While Nehemiah is away, the high priest who's supposed to be in charge obviously wasn't doing his duty because tithes must have been going down. He's got this storeroom. He empties it out and he gives it to Tobiah, which if you've been here through the whole series, was an enemy, actually conspired to kill the Jews, to stop them building the wall. And he gives them a room in the temple. And so we said, you know, what was the sin? Well, obviously, responsibility of not tithe, not collecting the tithes and not doing that. But even bigger than that, maybe, is letting God had strict rules who could be in the temple, and Tobiah was not allowed, obviously. And so breaking that. And then um, the damage from that, we talked about damage to his own witness. I mean, who would believe, the, who would trust the high priest now when he says, you need to obey, right? Now, when he himself isn't doing it, the damage to the witness to the Jews of saying, you know what, obeying God's word is not that big of a deal, not that important. The damage to the witness of God's holiness, you know, that they had to purify that storeroom. Nehemiah came back and tossed all those furniture out of the storeroom and then purified it because it had desecrated the temple and having this Tobiah live in it. And so, yeah, God's holiness isn't that important is what it was communicated and so we have all this damage, and then what can we learn? And we just talked about, seems the obvious application for us is just the pressures of the world that are on us as Christians, as a church, to conform, right? All that pressure to, to stray from God's word. Because we said, why did they do that? 
back in chapter 12, it says the people were so grateful and joyfully bringing their tithes, and they were so thankful for the work of the Levites and the priests. That's what the tithes were for, to support them. And so, and then Nehemiah leaves. It was great. Everybody was enjoying it. And then Nehemiah leaves. Why did they give it up? It was so good. And so we looked at why did they do that? It was probably, what, some greed maybe? Some, um, Tobiah was popular, and he had uh, well-liked in the world, and so maybe Eliashib wanted some of that popularity. There's some pressure because Tobiah was a relative. And so we looked at that and just how we need to stand strong. And then, so then this morning we're carrying on in chapter 13, and we're getting to that, that next section in uh, the next thing that Nehemiah finds. And actually, I'm going to skip right ahead to it. I was going to just, this is what um, Kevin read for us. Maybe I'll just go to the last bit that Kevin read for us, just to remind us, he, he ended it like this, For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister, and the gatekeepers, and the singers. And here is their promise, We will not neglect the house of our God. Okay? That's what they promised 12 plus years before. Chapter 13, verse 10. Here's what Nehemiah finds. So Nehemiah comes and he says, I found out that the portions for the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. Nehemiah comes back and what does he find? They haven't been giving the tithes. No one's been collecting them. The Levites have nothing to live on. Remember, they were God's chosen people to do the temple work. They have to eat and feed their families, so they go back to their fields and so that they can feed their families. Now that the work of the temple is not being done, And so what does Nehemiah do? He says, So I confronted the officials and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? Remember their promise? We will not neglect the house of God. Fast forward 12 plus years. Why is the house of God neglected, forsaken? Then Nehemiah said, So I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain and the wine and the oil into the storehouses. They got back to what they had promised to do, reinstituted it. Right, and so our our lens there. So, what was the sin? We kind of started this last week, but what was the sin? Well, obviously they are disobeying just the God's command to on all these ties and that. Um, Not only that, they had the sin of not caring for the Levites. I mean, to be put yourself in the shoes of the Levites, they've been given this task by God that they are supposed to obey, but they're starving because there's no food coming in for them, so they feel forced to abandon the job God had given them and go and work in the fields. And so that was just a not, that's not loving and caring for your fellow person. And so that was the sin. Why did they do it? I mean, we kind of started last week. I mean, again, because things were going so well. So maybe it was. I don't know, some greed in there, keeping more for themselves. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm just guessing that it was probably a bit of a slow fade. Times were tough, circumstances. We know it was hard living in Israel at this time in, Ju- in Judea. And so maybe it was just like, oh, I really can't. What if I think I don't think I'll have, I don't know. And so they, and they slowly faded and it got less and Maybe it just kind of, they stopped looking outside and kind of focused on their own family inside. And, and so there was some, some selfishness there. They weren't seeing the needs of the Levites. We kind of encountered that back earlier in Nehemiah where it talked about how the, they, were, they were all unified working on the wall and yet there was rich people who had been like charging huge interest to the poor people to where the poor people were selling their kids into slavery, right? And here they are supposedly working in unity on the wall. And it was like, Nehemiah finds out and he's like, how can this be? How can you say you're, you're all working together as one when you're doing this to your fellow? Maybe there's some of that going on there. Why'd they do it? And then what was the damage? Well, we can see the damage. The Levites had to go back. That's one part of the damage. The Levites had to go back to work. They couldn't feed their families. They had to, and when they had to leave their jobs at the temple. And so we, we learned back in chapter 8, the Levites were the ones who were explaining the God's word to the people, helping them understand how to obey it. Well, that wouldn't be happening now. And so you can think of the snowball that would happen. And then the witness, once again, we have that same damaging of the witness where, you know, well, I guess it's not that important to obey God's law about tithes and offerings. I guess it's not that important to care for his temple. 
that would have been the witness that would have gone from it. And so we get to that last question, what can we learn from this? How can we apply this for us? What is God saying to us here as Christians in 2024 here in Canada? Well, it's a bit of a challenging one, isn't it? Because we don't have a temple to support. We don't have some Levites to support. Um, And so what does this look like for us? What does it mean? How do we apply this idea and of tithes and offerings. Um, and so, if you've been in church for any amount of time, you've probably heard, you know, the idea that a Christian is to tithe. How many people, you heard that before? Okay, if we were to, if we were to, now I think probably the general kind of, if someone would say, what does that mean? Probably the answer that would be most commonly given is that a Christian today would give 10% of their money to a church. Do you agree? That's, that would probably be the general answer. Yeah? Okay. So that's so we're all on the same page. So that would say that would be most commonly understood of what it means to tithe today as a Christian. Well, can I tell you, I, I don't think you can actually find that in the Bible. <laughs> I don't think you, you can actually find anywhere where it'll say that as a Christian in 2024 in Canada that we are to give 10% of our income to a church. I I just don't think you're going to find that. So where does that come from then? Where, where do we get that idea that seems so common? Well, stick with me, okay? I mean, it's really important this morning that you don't hear what I'm not saying. I've said that before, okay? <laughs> don't hear what I'm not saying. We'll get there, okay? But stay with me. So what does the Bible teach? And this is what I want us to really look at this morning. I think there is something here, especially for us in the richest society that has ever, civilization has ever existed. I mean, really in the history of the world in terms of comforts and and wealth and that. So where do we get this idea then? Well, here's, here's, we're going to unpack it this morning. And so here, just to start off with some definitions, the word tithe just actually means a tenth. So that's what that means. You'll even have English translations that'll swap them, okay? So the word tithe just means a tenth, 10%. That's all the word literally means. So that's where the 10% thing comes from. The other word we've probably heard is we talk about an offering, and the word offering is very simple too. It just means to bring to, to offer. We still use it the same way in English, right? You offer something to someone, you gave them an offering, essentially. And so to offer. And so what we see in the Old Testament, where we see this foundation when it talks so much, like the verses that Kevin read for us, is that that's where we see that they were in the law, they were commanded to bring tithes, which just means a tenth, a 10%, and they were commanded to bring offerings, these certain specific things to God, okay? And so here's just, there's so many, if you go through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, there is a ton of verses in there that give really specific instructions to them on what to bring for tithes and offerings. And it was very specific. So here's just one verse as one example. So you can kind of see, or you can think about the verses that Kevin read. They had a lot of that too, but here's just one example. Deuteronomy 12, 6 says, And there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes, or your your one-tenths, and the contribution that you present, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and your flock. And so you can see there, um, just gives kind of a really big overview, but if you went through and read the rest of that chapter or other chapters in there, you would find it was very specific. They had specific grains that were the tenth. You give a tenth of this grain and that one of your oil, of your, of your wine, of, right? Very specific. There was very specific to their animals and their flocks. There was very specific other offerings that were given for very specific Jewish holidays and feasts. Each one had their own very, very specific of what they were to give. And then it tells us, if you remember to what Kevin read, exactly what it was for. What Kevin read was kind of a summary. Remember, Nehemiah is just recording what the people promised. They were promising to obey all this law. And so it it explains it. You know, we promise to bring this for this feast. We promise to bring this so that the Levites can have this. We promise this so that the temple will not be neglected. And so that's where the idea of a tie, the 10%, and an offering comes from. But the challenge for us is how do we apply that, right? That today, we don't have a temple. We don't have Levites to support. We don't celebrate a lot of those Jewish holidays specifically that way, right? And so we can't, if if it was about obeying that law, we can't do it. 
I mean, again, there is no temple. And even if we wanted to, not being Jews, they wouldn't accept it anyways, okay? So, so you can't obey that law directly, right? But what do we apply to ourselves? Because the Bible, although the New Testament, and, and by the way, the New Testament doesn't take it and say, hey, it used to, because it does this with a lot of the Old Testament law. It's like, this is what they are commanded, but that was kind of a foreshadowing of, and then the New Testament helps us understand how to apply it to us. But we don't get that. We don't get like a, any verse in the New Testament that says, give a tithe, a 10%, now to this. You used to give it to that, now give it to this. There isn't one. And what we'll actually find, and we're going to look at a few examples here, what we'll actually find is that it almost seems to go out of its way to not say that. And so we're going to look at that, okay? But I'm just kind of laying the foundation here so we understand how we can apply this to ourselves. Because the, although the New Testament doesn't give us some place where we can take, it says, okay, now you're to give your 10% not to the Levites or to the temple, but give it over here. Although we don't have that verse, it talks a ton about giving and generosity. So there's a responsibility, but how do we do it? How do we apply it? And so we'll go to the New Testament now. I'm going to be bouncing around. There's going to be screen, the verses will be on the screen, but you can, if you have your Bibles, I'll share the reference and you can follow with me. We're just going to look at what some of what Jesus taught. And I'm going to try and help us to see here what I believe God is teaching, teaching us. Because what we're going to see is that although it doesn't focus in on a certain amount, like the law did, the law was so specific, right? What God actually cares about is your heart. He wants you to have a heart of generosity. That's what he cares about. And I would actually say that that was his goal in the Old Testament too. For a lot of the law, he, he always wanted to get to the heart of it. And that was, the, that was the goal of his real purpose in those laws. It wasn't just that you would check the box and uh, uh, get to the law. It was what it did to your own heart. And that's actually kind of where we're going to start. If you go to the famous Sermon on the Mount, it's in Matthew chapter 6. Um, this is well known. You're probably familiar with the Sermon on the Mount. This is where Jesus gave this big sermon on a mount. And what he did throughout that sermon is he basically took the old law and he said, you have heard it said, you have heard it read, right? This, and he would, some Old Testament law, and then he'd say, but I say unto you, and he would take it and he would help us better understand it. He would get to the heart of it. That's the best way of saying it. He'd get to the heart of it. So you've heard some of these, like he would say, you've heard it said, don't murder. But I say unto you, if there's any hate in your heart, you've already committed a murder in your heart, right? And so Jesus is saying, he goes, look, you get to the end of the week, don't pat yourself on the back, be like, hey, I didn't kill anybody this week, I did pretty good, you know? That's not, he's going, no, he goes, the point of that law is that you would examine your heart and you'd say, is there any hatred in my heart? Because the sin is the root. And if you let that fester long enough, the, the murder th action can come right? You need to deal with the sin in your heart. That's the issue to deal with, not pat yourself on the back because you didn't kill anybody. It's the same idea with adultery, right? He says, you know, you've heard it said don't commit adultery. He says, but you have, if you even have lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery in your heart. He's like, deal with the lust issue and you'll never get to adultery, right? That's the issue. And so that's what he does. And so when he gets to, to giving and to money and to treasures, possessions and things like that, this is what he says. Matthew 6, verse 6, chapter 6, verse 19. He says, Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I'm starting here because this is the foundation of generosity and giving, right? He gets right down to the heart and he says it's about a direction of our being. It starts with what, what is our heart dedicated to? If with everything that we have, and it's not just money, but our time, our talents, our gifts, everything we have, we can either use them to serve ourselves and look for things in this life, or we can use them for things that have eternal value. That's the choice. And if you start, that's that you're kind of picking a direction, right? And it doesn't matter how much you give in either direction, you can give 10% and still be going the wrong direction. We're going to see that in the next one with the Pharisees, right? Or you can, that's why it wasn't about the amount. He's going, it's about your heart. 
I want you to have a generous heart and be going in this direction. If you strive after what is my kingdom, right, and these things, then all these other things are going to be added unto you, right? Seek first, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added unto you. Get in the right direction, and then it, you don't have to worry about amounts. That's not what he's most concerned about. He's worried about, he's concerned about your heart, the direction that you're heading. And that's why he ends it with this, a couple of verses later, verse 24, he sums it up by saying, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and money, or in the original language there, mammon, it was like not just money, but it was kind of like the God of money. It's kind of the word that's used there. Um, and so that's kind of how he sums it up. He goes, look, you have to, with your life, you're deciding which way is your life heading? Who's in charge? Are you living for yourself or are you living for God and things eternal? That's the choice to make. That's where the foundation of generosity starts and giving starts is on, built on that foundation. And so let me give you a couple examples here. We see this then. He lays this foundation for giving, and then he goes on, and you'll see this in some of the interactions he has. Here's one. This is him interacting with some Pharisees who many of them were quite wealthy. And Jesus is rebuking them. This is Matthew chapter 23. Okay, Matthew 23, verse 23 says this. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Remember, we've talked about hip hypocrisy before. That's saying one thing but doing another, right? Not living, not walking the talk. So he says, you hypocrites. So there's a criticism. And he says, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin. So tithe, again, just means 10%. They're given 10% of their spice rack um, away, okay? They're tithing on it. By the way, this wasn't required in the law. So they're going over and above, right? They didn't actually have to do this. There were specific things you had to tithe on, certain grains and oils and stuff like that. They decided to go further than that and tithe on these, these spice rack as well, these spices. But this is his criticism. He said, you're, doing, you're going over and above in your tithes. You're going doing more than. They would have been doing the other stuff too, for sure. They're doing more than. And he says, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You see that? And so he doesn't say, you look at giving doesn't matter. doesn't matter at all. That's not what he said. He's like, no, no. And he's not even criticizing that they went past the law. He goes, you can do that. Give generously. Tithe your spice rack. Go ahead and do it. But you're missing the point, he says. Like, you're missing the point that it's not about God getting some of your spices. God doesn't need your spices. God cares about your heart. The things that He cares about is justice and mercy and faithfulness. Do you know what? Some of those tithes and offerings that were given, they were prescribed in the law, they were, some of that was for the poor and those that couldn't have enough, right? The Levites, one of their jobs is they took that in. Part of it was that they were to distribute it to those that didn't have enough. And so here we had this contrast, and if you know about kind of the Pharisees, they were actually heaping more burden onto the poor, Right? And still keeping the law, keeping a check, checking the box every time, but without any heart to actually care for the justice and the mercy. We see this, if you remember, when Jesus clears out the temple, right? Here you have all the most religious people, and they're exhorting, taking too much. They're making a profit, using the law to make a profit for themselves, right? That's why Jesus was so angry when he cleared the temple, because they were checking the box. You had to bring this stuff. They were doing the according to the law, but they were doing it. They had no care for the people. They'd actually used it to, um, to actually get their hearts further from God. And so this is why I think, just this is why we're getting to it, why the New Testament, I think, doesn't, why Jesus didn't specify a number, right? Why he didn't reiterate that, okay, it's 10%. This is why Jesus didn't do that, because I think he knows us as humans, right? He knows our, our faults. Because just think about it. If, if, if there had been a verse in there that said, okay, 10%, here it is, how many people would give more, right? Or do you think the human tendency is more to be like, here's a line I got to get to, and once I get there, hey, I'm good, right? Isn't that the way human nature works? Isn't that what we might do if there was a number we had to reach, if it was all about just getting to the bar? 
we'd get there and stop. We know ourselves. Would it, does that promote generosity? Or does it say, you know, I just promote getting to the line? Does it instill that idea that, okay, God, 10% is yours and 90% is mine? Isn't that what that would communicate? I'm just talking. I mean, like we, we're human. We get this, right? Like, I wish that wasn't the fault of our hearts, but it is. And so that's why I think it doesn't give us a specific amount. And he starts to get to that with the Pharisees. Here's another example. This is, this is a positive one in, in Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, verses 40, starting at verse 41, if you're following along in your own Bibles. This is where Jesus, it's right before the Passover, and he has all his disciples at the temple, and he's observing the treasury, and, and what does he do? Jesus, they're watching, and it says, and he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting, putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put everything she had, all she had to live on picture it there. He's, they're sitting there. They're observing. I mean, the temple was this massive complex. The disciples are there, and they're watching, and they're watching people put money in the offering box, and rich people are putting whole bags of silver and stuff in there, and I'm sure the disciples were amazed, right? And then a widow comes up, and Jesus sees this lesson, and he points out, and he goes, see those people? He, they're all amazed at the amount. And Jesus basically says, it's not about the amount. He goes, yeah, they might be giving their tithe. That's probably what they were doing, right? Giving their 10% to rich people. And he goes, yeah, but he goes, but they're more focused on the 90%. That's where their care is. They're given out of their abundance. Their, their desires, that, that direction that they're headed, right? Their desires, they're more focused on the 90 and then the 10 is what? But look at the widow. She's more focused on, she, her heart is in the right direction. She's able to give everything because of her faith. She's able to give everything because she believes that that's the priority. She wants to do everything she can for God. He goes, look at her. She's the one that has the right heart. And so the point is not that, again, it's not so easy, especially in our day and age, to get focused on amounts. Oh, so then you're saying that Christians have to give 100%. No, because again, that's focusing on amounts. What Jesus is pointing out here is the heart of the widow, that she gave everything because her heart cared so deeply. Her desire was so much to glorify God. And so the point is not that it doesn't have to be 100. The point is, would you? It's not do you have to, is would you? Is that where your heart, is that the commitment you have to God? That if he asked that, you would? Do you have that kind of faith in him? One more, and this one I think just sums it up so well. It's from, well, there's three different gospels. This is from Luke's recording in Luke chapter 18. And it's an interaction between Jesus and a rich young ruler. Luke chapter 18, starting at verse 18, says this. And a ruler asked him, Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Wouldn't we love to get those questions? Right? As we talk about being a witness, someone walk up and be like, Hey, how can I be saved? Um, <laughs> I wish it was that easy all the time, but... Anyway, so a guy comes up to Jesus, and rich young ruler comes up to Jesus and asks that question. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. That's a whole nother sermon in itself. It'll be interesting sometime. Don't have time today. But then Jesus kind of directly answers this question, and he says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he, the young ruler, said, all these I have kept since my youth. I think one of the other ones says, like Jesus says, you know, keep the law, basically. And the, and the young ruler says, I have kept the whole law since my youth. I'm doing it. I'm sure he stumbled and offered the right sacrifice and did those things. Okay? So you get the picture? A young ruler, rich young ruler comes up to Jesus, and there's something in Jesus that draws him. And he comes to Jesus, and he says, what do I have to have, do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you already know the answer. Follow the law. 
right? Remember, this is before Jesus has died. He can't say, believe in my death and resurrection. It hasn't happened yet, okay? So he goes to him, and he says, follow the law. The law is always going to point to Christ anyways. So he goes, follow the law. And the, and the ruler says, yeah, I, I've done that. I followed the whole law, right? And so in following the whole law, I mean, this is just a snippet here, but we can be quite confident he's followed the tithing and the offering laws as well, okay? So he's followed all that. He said, but I've kept them all. And obviously he knows there's still something missing, right? Otherwise, what's he coming to Jesus for? What's he, why is he still going on? He knows there's something missing. And look at Jesus' response. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Okay. And have treasure in heaven. Sound familiar? Where did we just see that phrase a little bit again, right? Back in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Where he said, you got to choose. You can choose to store up treasure here. You can choose to store up treasure in heaven. You can choose who your God is. Is it God or is it mammon, money, pleasures, treasures of this world? You have to choose. And so Jesus looks at this guy. This guy's going, there's something missing in my life, Jesus. What is it I need? And Jesus is like, if you keep the law, you know that. That's, what the, that's how a relationship God, with God was defined before Jesus died. And he's like, I've done that. And Jesus says, oh, if you really want to know what's lacking, what's missing in your life, give it all away. You're so, he, Jesus knows his heart. Jesus goes, it's, you're too focused on your riches. Give it all away and come follow me. You want to find true joy and happiness and fulfillment? You want to know what's missing? Give up all of that pursuit and turn and come and follow me. Jesus given him that choice, right? And really, folks, can I say this is, He's basically saying, how do I become a Christian? And Jesus says, follow me. Is that not the definition of a Christian right there? We talked about what a disciple is. It's someone who follows Jesus. That was the offer. Jesus says, give it all away and come follow me. Come be one of my disciples. And then one of the hardest verses in the New Testament is just a, but when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. The other, some of the other gospel recorders um, recorded where he says, and he walked away sad. He had a choice. Jesus said, come follow me. What are you going to choose? God or mammon, right? Where's your heart? What's the direction of your life? And knowing what would be the struggle for this guy, this young rich ruler. And he chose to walk away sad. And Jesus explains, Jesus seeing that he had become sad said, how difficult is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And there's been lots on these verses. You might have heard the thing about there was a gate in the wall in Jerusalem called the camel gate, and, but it was so short you had to take the pack off the camel to get it through. Anybody heard that one? Yeah, it doesn't pointless doesn't matter right because <laughs> what jesus is saying here is that for a rich person to get into the kingdom of heaven it's as hard as a literal camel going through the literal eye of a needle that's what he's actually saying okay and the point is this that you can't choose it's the same point he made in the sermon on the mount you can't choose the road, if money is your God, there is no amount of rules. There's no amount of, you know, you can't percentage. There's no amount. There's nothing you can do if that's the direction of your heart. It has to be God, has to be God. And then amounts won't matter, okay? You can't, a rich person can't make money their God and worship God. That's what he's saying. It is impossible to fully serve God if money is your God. No amount of rules and, and laws and stuff that you meet is going to be enough to save you. And that's why he says what's impossible with man is possible with God. You can't do it. It takes surrender. It takes surrender. And that's what we see in the next verses. Peter pipes up, and you can just think of what Peter's thinking here. Well, he shows us what he was thinking. Peter says, Jesus, see, we have left our homes and followed you. And he, Jesus, said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time 
and in the age to come, eternal life. So Peter goes, I, I, I kind of read this, this is just me maybe. I'm reading into where Peter's going like, he's kind of going, Jesus, am I good? <laughs> like, I, I kind of left everything. I left, my, I left my family too. Everything to follow. Remember, he dropped the nets and walked away from his fishing business and followed Jesus, him and his brother. And Jesus assures him and says, I say to you, everyone who's left these things. Now, what is this? I, I'm glad that he talks about, he switches that Jesus talks about wife and brothers and parents because I think this helps us understand how it's not about amounts, how about it's about our heart. Because he's not saying that to get to heaven, you have to leave your wife. Obviously, right? What's he saying? He's saying that the Christian life is a full surrender. That's what he's saying. He's going, Peter, it's a full surrender. This is what we kind of did last week with, in the last two weeks with baby dedications, right? We're taking our kids that God has this gift, this blessing from God, and we're saying, we are dedicating it back to you, Lord. This child is yours. We don't care if, you, if they're famous or if they have a hard life as long as it's in your will. You might call them to be a missionary in a really hard place, but God, we are dedicated them to you. We want our kids to love you with their whole heart, soul, strength, and mind. That's our desire, that they would serve you with their whole heart. And so we're giving them back to you. And that's what the Christian life is. It's a complete surrender of everything we have, including our family and every possession we have, to God. And this is what's so great. And he then entrusts them back to us to steward them well for his glory, right? And for some people, this is, in many places in the world, this is the reality that when they become a Christian, that their families may reject them and kick them out. But it reveals the heart. Are you willing? That's the heart that God demands. And so that's what he's talking about when it comes to everything that he has blessed us with. Do we hold it and say, Lord, it is all yours to be used for your kingdom. I surrender it all. And then he takes it, all of it, not 10%, 100%. He takes all 100%, and then he entrusts it to you to steward it for his kingdom. Amen. Luke 18. And so there's the foundation. And so, but then how do we practically do this, right? Right? How do we, what does it look like to practically walk this out as Canadian Christians 2024, right? So there's a passage I want to go to to finish off, and that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And so you can turn there. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And this is a letter. The letters, we're going to actually touch on 1 Corinthians first because it introduces it, but the letters of 1 and 2 Corinthians are letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in Corinth, okay? 1 and 2 Corinthians. Um, and obviously, first letter, second letter. So um, in the first letter, right at the very end, this is 1 Corinthians 16, this is what Paul writes. He says, now concerning a collection for the saints... So, I know I said 2 Corinthians, but we're going to start here. So, 1 Corinthians 16. So, Paul says, okay, concerning a collection for the saints, what's he talking about? There was a famine going on in Jerusalem, and they were having a really, people were, Christians were having a really hard time, starving, right? And so, Paul went to all these, these churches in kind of modern-day Turkey and, and Greece and stuff, and he went to them, and he got a collection. He wrote letters to them and said, hey, would you set some money aside, and I'm going to come, or some of my workers are going to come, and we're going to collect it all, and we're going to take it to Jerusalem so they can buy food and survive, the Christians in Jerusalem. Okay, so that's what he's talking about. Concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. So a couple things here. I just thought this is, again, to help us kind of, how do we make this applicable, practical? First off, you see, he doesn't use the word tithe. I'll just point that out, right? He doesn't give it a specific amount. He calls it a collection and a gift, Okay but there's still a responsibility on them to give something, right? So it's not that there's no responsibility, but he says, okay, here's the need, and how's the responsibility? And, and this gift that I want you to give. And then he gives some things that I think are really helpful to us, right? On the first day of the week, 
Each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper. I think that's really helpful to us. There are a couple of principles there that we can apply. First off, they made it regular. This is Paul speaking to a church. He says, look at here's some good pr- practical advice application. Make it regular, right? In your giving, put something aside every week. I don't like how he says, I, I didn't notice, I was talking to Amanda last night, and she noticed that it was the first day of the week. And she, that just jumped out to her as priority, right? You make it a priority. When, when, you, when income comes, the first thing you take off, right? You take off something, and you put it aside. And so there's a principle there of that as Christians, I think that we can apply this, right? This is to a church, modern-day church. As Christians, we put something aside on a regular basis for giving, right, to needs that God gives, shows us. And then you see that it was something. He didn't give a specific amount. He just says something. Give something. And so you need to figure, and we're going to see that we're going to come to the verse, the well-known one in 2 Corinthians about God loves a cheerful giver, right? And it kind of explains that, what you have decided in your heart. And so you give something. And then I like how he kind of, at the end, he says, as he may prosper. So it seems somewhat proportional. You have some extra, give some extra. Having a tight week, give less. I don't know, as he may prosper. But choose to give something, right? Choose to give something. Store it up. Put it aside as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. And so I think this is where the idea of a tithe can come back in, okay, as a principle, not as a firm thing. I don't believe in the New Testament we're giving. We have to give 10% of the church. I've already said I don't think that you find that in the Scriptures that applies to us directly. But as a principle, in terms of a regular giving towards the needs of God's kingdom, that principle. And so this is where, like, when I'm doing premarital counseling with a new young couple and their work finances is one of the weeks we talk about, right, as they go to enter into marriage. And one of the things is, like, encouraging this, right, from this. You know, set something in your budget. You're going to make a budget together in your new married life. You're making a budget. This should be something you consider biblically, is that you set something aside. Um, And if they go, well, how much? I go, that's up to you, you know. Look at your own heart. But if you want just a starting point, 10% 10% seems like it was reasonable for the Old Testament. Now, funny thing with that is that if you add up everything, it's actually more like 20 if you add up all the other feasts and stuff like that. So just another. But, but anyways, but just the point is, is that there's, we know how we are as humans, and God is calling us to, to you, know, you can examine your own heart and see what are the motivations, right? And that's why it was, we're going to get to in 2 Corinthians. God, it's more about, he's going to give us some parameters around that figuring out the how much in our hearts. We'll get to that just in a second. So there's something, and then the last principle, I think this is just, a, I just want to say thanks to our tellers and our treasurer and that, because it's, it's biblical right here. Paul says, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. I just pull a little application out of here that it is wise for our church to have tellers and to record it and to give receipts and to keep track of it and to be completely above board with everything and have a record. You know, even Paul was like, he didn't just go, hey, I'm Apostle Paul, give me, this, give me the money and I'll yeah, just trust me, right? He's like, no, I want you to feel safe. Write a letter, say who you would like to do it, sign it. I'll take the money and the letter so they know it's from you, right? So there is, there's good principles for how we manage. This is again goes to stewardship as individuals and as a church. Okay, so there's first letter. This is what he says to them. And then in the second letter, 2 Corinthians, he's now writing a second letter to them, starting in chapter 9, and uh, he follows up. He says, So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers, so Paul's sending some other people, he couldn't go himself, to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift that you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift and not an exaction. So Paul's like, okay, we're coming to get it now, and I'm sending a couple people ahead just to remind you, so you're ready. And then Paul kind of gives this, some things that are going to help us apply this. He says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, but whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So he uses this picture of like a farmer they'd understand. You sow a little bit of seed, you get a little bit of harvest. You sow, sow more, you reap, you harvest more. That's just that's how it works. We know that. And so then he says, And each one must give as he has decided in his own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 
And so these verses have been so abused by prosperity gospel preachers and stuff like that to say that, hey, you give $100, God will give you 1000 right? And that is just, that is offensive to God. He's not a slot machine, okay? And there's not, if they would just keep reading, they would see that so clearly because it is not about reaping more material stuff for you. It's not like give your 10% so that God can give you more if you're 90. I mean, that is just completely counter to what he's trying to say here. What he's saying is that sow generosity. If you sow generosity in your own heart by the action of giving, you're going to reap more generosity. In your own heart, as you are generous, it will make you more generous. Your heart will become more generous, and your generosity will foster more generosity among others. We know that, right? That's how it works. And so that's what he's saying. He said, so that's why he can say each one has decided in his own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, which is exactly what the prosperity gospel preachers use that verse. They just read one more. They get that, right? It's a, it's a, it's a tactic. But that's not, the, they just, that's not the point. He said, don't give under compulsion. The point is, is that your desire is to generate generosity in your heart, right? God loves a cheerful giver. God loves people who give out of generosity, a heart that wants to give. Remember, think of the contrast with the rich young ruler, right? That was his problem. He decided to walk away sad. He could have given cheerfully and generously and had a life, all the joy of following Jesus, but he said, no, I'm going to choose. See the contrast? That's what it means to be a cheerful giver. It means to have the right understanding, the right perspective to say, I want to give this because I so want God to use it. I'm so blessed. I'm so happy to be able to be used by God to help this need. I can't wait to be able to do something for His kingdom, right? That's the kind of, that's the cheerful giver that God is looking for. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, not material blessings, all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. I just love that verse, all the all, all, all superfluous language, right? He's not talking about material blessings. He's saying, look at when you generate a generous heart, right? When you live according to, out of generosity, if that's the posture of your heart, you're going to have so many opportunities. Grace, God's grace in your life. He's going to provide. You're going to see Him providing. And you're going to be able to abound in every good work. Kind of like Ephesians 2.10, that He's created us for good works that He's prepared in advance for us to do, right? That kind of an idea, good work. And so when you're generous, you get these opportunities. You get to be part of what God's doing. It's awesome. And he says, as it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Again, all there about, about spiritual treasure, not earthly ones. He who supplies the seed to the sower and the bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Not your bank account your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. And I think that sums it up so much there. That's what this is talking about. That's what God's desire is, is that He would grow generous hearts in us. And if we have generous hearts, He doesn't have to worry about the amounts, right? He knows that. If we would all have hearts of generosity, then the amounts don't matter. That'll just happen. Much the same that if we have Bad hearts, like the Sermon on the Mount, if your heart is dirty and, and wrong, going the wrong direction, then you're not going to be able to hide it and the sin will come out sooner or later, right? It's a heart issue. God's desire is that He would generate generous hearts in us that will produce thanksgiving to God. And so we've talked about a few principles, but then here's kind of a, another thing that can help us, these last couple verses. Verse 12 and 13. These I like because I think it gives us kind of a purpose or a goal, a way of filtering. And when the need comes, how do we handle it practically um, when God presents something, give, a need comes before us? Verse 12 says, For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, 
but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. So first off, when you look at, if you're evaluating, what do you do? What does it mean to be generous? How can you be generous? First off is just, is there a practical need? And the New Testament talks about this a ton. You know, Jesus said, like, when he's talking about the, the sheeps and the goats passage, right, where he's saying, like, when did you see me hungry? When did you, Jesus, when do we see you hungry and thirsty and, and naked and needed clothes? And Jesus says, when you did it for the least of these, when there was a need and you met it, right? And so that kind of idea, or, um, had them down. To care for the poor and the, the widow and the orphan. We have lots of verses that talk about that. To provide for brothers who are in need, like a bunch of verses that talk about that. And so there's lots of opportunity. And so the first thing, very simply, where can you give? How do you know what to give? How to give? Is there a need? Pretty simple, right? Has God put a need in front of you? Is there some opportunity you have to care for somebody? This is what the food pantry is about, right? Where we're saying, look at there's something we can do where we can meet practical needs. But there's a second thing to it too, so that it will overflow in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. See what you're saying? It's not just that we meet a need, but that we meet it in Jesus' name. That we do it in such a way that God uses it. If you have the opportunity, the generosity of our hearts, what it does is it's actually a tool, a witness tool of the gospel. That we don't just give that cup of cold water, but we give it in Jesus' name. That we go to people and we're, it's just... It's an opportunity for us to say, we want to meet this physical need, but we know something, that an even greater need you have, a spiritual need. Jesus wants to offer you eternal life. That's the gospel message, right? And so that's the beauty of generosity. That's, what, that's the purpose of us giving. It's not just to meet the practical need, although that's cool that we get to be Jesus' hands and feet, but that we would do it in such a way that people would come to know that there's a God who loves them and that died for them and wants them to, to come to know Him and have eternal life. And so there you go. That's about what I can give you. There's some practical things, principles you can apply, and then there's some filters as you, the needs come to you. And again, this doesn't just apply to money. This is about time. This is about your vehicle. Does someone need a ride? This is about your house. Does someone need a roof to, a room to stay in? This is about your gifts. This is about your mentorship, Right? What do you have that can be used, that you can be generous with to advance, to meet needs, and to share the gospel? And then, I like how Paul added just this last little bonus for us. When you do, he's like, by the way, while they long for you and pray for you because of their surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift. He's like, you know what the bonus is? When you're generous, people are grateful. And sometimes they won't have anything materially to give you back. But they'll pray for you. They'll thank you, right? And that is such an amazing gift. Anybody ever had like a sponsored kid, like Compassion or World Vision, right? You know you're never going to get money. You're giving money every month. You're never going to get any back, right? But how, who's been blessed by those letters and those pictures and those, amen, right? That's, that, that's what that's talking about. When we are generous and we give and we see a need and we do something and we give it, we get blessed by the response and uh, especially being prayed for for those that can't give us something in some other way. Beautiful picture. And there's so much more we could have said this morning. Go read the beginning of the Acts Church in Acts like 2 to 4 and just some of that picture. Just a beautiful picture of what God is calling us into. And so, sum it all up, okay? What God cares about is your heart. That's what He desires. He desires to grow in you a generous heart. And if we all are desire to have grow in generosity, the amounts don't matter. It's not some bar or line we're trying to meet. What God wants is a generous heart, and everything else will take care of itself. And so how can you, you use what God has given you to be a witness for Jesus? That's given the cup of cold water in Jesus' name. Pray and ask God to show you where there are needs and ask Him to show you how to help. I think one of our problems we're seeing is that 
our society has become so isolated, you know? I think I, that line before, our, our fences got higher and our dinner tables got smaller. You know, that's just the society we live in, right? And so it's hard to even know that there's a need. And so we need to pray. Lord, we want to be able to be a witness for you. How can we help? Where can we give? Where can we be generous? And then how is God looking to grow generosity in your own heart? And this is where you can go back to Nehemiah and you can go through that that checklist and you can look, what are the motivations of my heart? Are you wrestling with generosity in some way? And look at that and think, why am I wrestling with that? What are the things that are keeping me back from being generous? What is God maybe asking me to let go of a little bit? It may not be money. It might be time, right? It might be something else. Is there anything that you're not being generous with that God has entrusted to you that he's saying, open up your hands and experience the joy of generosity. Don't walk away sad. Let's pray. Oh, God, we are so incredibly blessed, Lord. We are so grateful for all that you have given us. Um, Lord, help us to remember that it's all from you. It's so easy in a world, that, that society that talks so much about going out and earning and making and, and that, but we forget, Lord, that we didn't choose to be born here. We didn't choose the families we live in, Lord. You have blessed us so much, God, and you have entrusted it to us to be used for your glory. And so our desire, Lord, is that we would, um, would be obedient, Lord, to use all that you have entrusted with to see your name go forth. We ask, Lord, that you would open doors, Lord. You have blessed us individually in this church so much, Lord. Would you give opportunities? We pray for opportunities with the, the food pantry. We thank you for all the food that's come in and and just our desire, Lord, is to be a blessing. Would you bring us opportunities, Lord? If there's people that have needs, Lord, don't let anything hinder them from coming and receiving, Lord. And then, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would generate in us hearts that are generous like yours. We thank you that you did not consider um, staying in heaven, Lord, but you humbled yourself and took the form of a servant and lived this difficult life and went to death, even death on a cross, in order to save us. Lord, help us to have that kind of love for others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.